Melbourne's tram system is the largest worldwide, being an outlier in Australia and much of the English speaking or even the Western world. It's one of very few significantly sized tram systems to have survived almost untouched to the present day. So why did Melbourne's tram network survive when so many others didn't? With around 250 kilometers of double track tram line and 1700 tram stops, Melbourne has the largest tram network in the world. The network remains mostly concentrated in the inner to middle suburbs of Melbourne. And in this regard, the network infrastructure is largely unchanged from the 1960s. Yet, if we look elsewhere in Australia, there are no significant tram systems. Sydney recently spent billions of dollars on its CBD and Southeast light rail, but its 15 kilometer length is nothing compared to its first tram network, which closed fully in 1961. Adelaide has a single tram line that for the most part might as well be a commuter train, having barely survived 1960s plans to convert it into an expressway after most of the network was closed in 1958. And in the modern era, despite all of its plans, Adelaide has yet to significantly expand its tram network. And elsewhere in Australia, tram system closed between the 1940s and 1970s include Hobart, Launceston, Geelong, Ballarat, Bendigo, Perth, Fremantle, Kalgoorlie, Newcastle, you get the point. Indeed, most tram networks across the globe were abandoned around this time. And although more than 300 cities still operate tram networks today, the overwhelming majority of those are in European countries. But even within Europe, some countries like the UK, Ireland, France and Spain almost completely closed their tram systems. This leaves Melbourne's tram system as one of only a handful of major systems located outside of Europe, and indeed the largest tram network in the world. Other non-European tram networks that survived in some way, shape or form include Toronto, San Francisco, Philadelphia, Kolkata, and several cities in other places. So why did so many tram networks close in the middle of the 20th century? Post-World War II, urban planning principles changed rapidly. Here in Australia, influence especially from the United States led to, as already mentioned, most tram networks nationwide being replaced with buses. The primary reason for this was the preferred mode of the time, the car. Trams were labelled as outdated, slow-moving obstacles that caused traffic congestion and blocked the path of fast, free-flowing cars. Lobbying from the oil industry was also often a factor, as electric trams were replaced with diesel buses and petrol cars. In Australia, seeing the closure of virtually every tram system across the remainder of the Anglosphere, our own tram systems slowly disappeared. First came regional systems, with the likes of Newcastle, Geelong and Kalgoorlie abandoning trams in the early 1950s. Although, to be fair, whoever thought Kalgoorlie was large enough for a tram network in the 1920s was probably a little bit insane. In 1958, major cities slowly began to shut their systems, with Perth and Adelaide removing their entire networks. Perhaps most notably, in 1961, Sydney shut its last tram line between Circular Quay and La Perouse, a system that was once one of the largest in the world at almost 300 kilometers. In Brisbane, the second last major city to retain its tram system besides Melbourne. Plans were initially also to retain and upgrade the system. Large sections of track were placed in concrete, which reduced maintenance cost and also made it more costly to remove. And as late as 1961, new lines were still being constructed. However, in September 1962, a depot fire at Paddington, the subject of a number of ongoing conspiracy theories involving anti-tram mayor Clem Jones, led to around 20% of the tram fleet being destroyed. This forced the closure of several tram lines and began the decline of Brisbane's tram network. But how long will it last? Will Brisbane follow Sydney and other capitals and replace its trams with buses? Or will it, like Melbourne, keep the trams? Only the future can provide the answer. To retrospectively answer the question from this video, no, the trams did not last and they were closed in April 1969. This left Melbourne as the last major city in Australia with an extensive tram system. And after the closure of the Ballarat and Bendigo tram networks in 1971 and 1972, the only network in the country. So how did this happen? Foremost, Melbourne was later than other cities to develop its tram network. The city developed an extensive cable tram network in the 1880s, but this was not electrified until the 1920s and 1930s. 
Despite the construction of some older electric lines beginning in 1906, especially in inner to middle suburban areas, the former cable lines were still the backbone of the network, requiring the most maintenance and seeing the most trams. Additionally, older electric trams had been replaced in the 1920s, 30s, 40s and even 50s with newer W series trams. As such, most of the infrastructure and vehicles were only at maximum 20 to 30 years old by the 1950s. In Sydney for comparison, some track and vehicles could be 60 years old or potentially even more at the time of closure. Although proposed modernizations from the early 1950s that only narrowly got cancelled is definitely something for the subject of another video, as is the story of Brisbane abandoning its trams. Nevertheless, unlike other cities, Melbourne did not immediately need to renew its tram vehicles and infrastructure, which due to the enormous cost that this would pose, was the primary reason for closure in other cities. Moreover, infrastructure improvements that were made were largely focused on concreting existing tram tracks, which, as aforementioned, decreased the arguments that the infrastructure of trams is more expensive than of buses, and additionally, increased the cost of removing the network. Trams had also very recently still been expanded. In 1940, cable trams on Burke Street, the very last of their kind, had been replaced with double-decker buses. However, in 1955 and 1956, these buses, which had proved ineffective, were replaced with electric trams. 40 new W7 class trams were built, and these new modern lines were the pride of the tramways board. Moreover, the hosting of the 1956 Olympics placed additional pressure on Melbourne's public transport network. Trams were used to carry thousands of patrons to event locations, clearly demonstrating the value of trams for sporting and other large events. Additionally, in moving so many people and getting cars off the road, this persuaded the public that trams reduced rather than increased traffic. The Tramways Board, needing to be cost effective, also focused its closures on select low used lines like Point Ormond and Footscray, which I've made a video about which will be linked in the top right corner right now. Watch it after the rest of this video. These lines were short with low ridership, and as such, their closures reduced operating deficits without significantly reducing the system. Some other cost-saving measures were also made, such as the closure of Hawthorne and Coburg tram depots, reducing tram frequencies, and scrapping older surplus trams. However, what is generally considered to be the most important factor is the Melbourne Metropolitan Tramways Board, MMTB, Chairman, Sir Robert Risson. A former Army General, he'd moved from the Brisbane to Melbourne tram system in 1949. Being independent of government, Risson was under no obligation to close the tram system, and personally expressed enormous preference for trams over buses. In particular, Risson emphasised the economic and transportational advantages of trams, which included the ability to carry more passengers at a lower cost, and that he considered trams to be more efficient. Risson managed the tramways board very effectively, and repeatedly clearly stated his firmly held belief that trams were superior to buses. This included a number of public relations stunts, for example. In 1963, after an incident involving the death of a worker while manoeuvring the electric trolley pole that connects the tram to the overhead wires, Risson personally demonstrated the correct method of trolley pole usage for the media to disparage any concerns that trams could potentially be unsafe for their workers. Risson also attempted to educate the public on how trams help traffic move faster rather than slower, as seen in this excerpt from 1966 film Citizen Tram, which clearly demonstrates Risson and the tramways board's views. Just look at that, will you? Great monster. All they do is cause congestion and block up the road. But surely it's the other way around, Mr. Johnson. Now let's take the tram out of the picture. It certainly leaves a nice wide space. Ah, but we forgot. That tram was carrying 90 passengers, Mr. Johnson. How do we get those 90 passengers to work? That's about 70 cars. Heavens. As you can see, these cars, even when they're jammed head to tail, take up 20 times more road space than the tram did. Multiply them by several thousand peak period tram trips a day, and you'd have one third of a million additional cars on the road. Replace the trains with buses then? Certainly. Buses coming up. Wait a minute. 
You've replaced that tram with more than one bus. You've got two and a third buses. I had two. A bus has a far smaller passenger carrying capacity than a tram. Other reasons to consider are that Melbourne's inner city streets are comparably wide, and thus trams do not take up as much space, quote unquote. This compares to Sydney, for example, where much of the inner city streets are fairly narrow and windy. Undoubtedly too were the impacts of the relative modernity of the system and the independence of the tramways board. When Brisbane was busy shutting down the last of its tram system, the MMTB was busy opening the new Queen's Way Express tram line in 1968. Even if it was only a short section, it was a psychological win for the tramway's cause. It proved that trams could be modern, fast, and still fit into modern transport plans. The board being independent also helped considerably. Premier Henry Bolte was an opponent of the tram system, but could not directly order its closure, and following his 1972 resignation, the tram system still survived. The impact of Risson cannot be understated though. He was labelled as the man who deserves full credit for saving our trams by Transport Minister Alan Brown, a minister who presided over the closure of various regional rail lines and planned enormous metropolitan transport cuts, no less, in 1994. Ultimately, by the mid-1970s, transport planning attitudes had changed. Other cities in Australia were now regretting the closure of their trams. In Adelaide, for example, the closure of the Glenelg line in favour of a freeway never occurred, and by the mid-1970s, plans were already being considered to extend the line once again to the northeast, in line with Stadtbahn light rail concepts that had emerged in Germany, although this never actually occurred. Additionally, in Melbourne, in 1971, Transport Minister Vernon Wilcox admitted to have had doubts about the future of trams a few years ago, but the trams had now proved their worth in moving people in the mass. This represents the gradual shift in attitudes both within the government and the public with regards to trams in the late 1960s and early 1970s. In 1972, this same Vernon Wilcox tended the construction of 100 new trams which eventually became the Z1 class, showing a complete turnaround in his view. In 1977, construction began on the East Burwood tram extension, which was completed in 1978 as a modern dedicated tram line. This was a symbol of the fact that the tram system had now been saved. Today, Melbourne has the largest tram network in the world at 250 kilometers of double track, although it will probably be overtaken by the likes of Paris or Berlin in future. Still, while other cities like Sydney spend billions on rebuilding tram lines ripped out six decades ago, we Melburnians can sit smugly thanking Robert Risson for what is perhaps the greatest transport decision ever made in this city, still paying dividends to this day. Thank you.